ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد all praises due to allah we praise him we seek his aid and we ask for his forgiveness we seek refuge in Allah from the evils of ourselves and the evil consequences of our actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, none can lead astray, and whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray, none can guide. I bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped except Allah alone, who has no partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad وسلم, is his servant and his messenger. Indeed, the best speech is that of Allah, and the best guidance is that of his Prophet Muhammad and the worst thing in the religion are the newly invented matters and all the newly invented matters in religion are innovation and every innovation is misguidance and every misguidance leads its people to the hellfire. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm very happy and glad to be here. Uh, and it's an honor for me to be at Masjid al-Huda here in Bradford. So I appreciate the opportunity and I appreciate uh, you staying here and listening to this lecture. Jazakumullah khair. Uh, sweetness in Salah. There is a strong connection between the way a person or the manner in which a person prays and the position he's going to make into paradise. There's a strong connection between your rank in paradise and the amount of khushu' focus that you find in the prayer. Strong connection. These are not my words, but I will relate, inshallah, uh, mention the name of the originator of, this, of these words later on, inshallah. I just want you to imagine someone walking into the masjid, he prays, whether individually, he prays his sunnah, or he prays with the imam and jama'ah, and in the middle of the prayer, let's say he has a beard, and he's playing around with his beard, just doing like that. Okay, do you think this person really is concentrating in what he is doing in his prayer? No, no. Okay, the answer is no. Let me ask another question. Focus, concentration, which is in other words khushu' or the reason, the root of khushu' Which place or where does it take place? The heart. The heart. Excellent, the heart. Khushu' is in the heart, yet you can't see this man's heart. His focus is in the heart. But you made a judgment about his heart without being able to see his heart. You just saw him, you saw his external behavior, and you passed a judgment on his heart that he doesn't have khushu'. Why? Because of the action? Yeah, you saw his action, but you passed a judgment on his heart. Does that make sense? Who does it make sense to? Let me see the hands, put them up to where I can see them. Okay, who believes that this is not a justified judgment? And that we cannot actually pass a judgment? Almost equally, who's not sure? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I side with uncle here, with the first answer. There is a very strong connection between your heart and your actions. Actions stem from the heart. It's impossible for someone to be interested in something, yet not have his actions gravitating towards that thing, which he loves or he's, he, has fo he has some kind of concentration or focus on that thing. Wherever the heart goes, the actions will flow. Wherever the heart goes, the actions will flow. Okay? If you have noticed, I've been paraphrasing a statement from the Prophet ﷺ. The Messenger ﷺ said, Indeed, there is a piece of flesh or a morsel of flesh in the body. If it's sound and intact, the rest of the body will be sound, will be in good shape. But if it's corrupt, the rest of the body will be corrupt. Indeed, it is the heart. So the secret of a human being is, a, is, is the heart. Obviously, 
Your judgment cannot be final. And this is why we're not supposed to judge people's intentions. But roughly speaking, it's a strong cue or, or clue. When you see someone, you see their external behavior, you can have a good idea of what's going on in their hearts. Okay? Now, when you see someone okay, playing around with their beard or probably you know, checking their watch, making sure time is right, or maybe even searching in their pockets, you would automatically think, okay, this man doesn't have khushur, he doesn't have focus in the prayer, he's not really concentrating on the things or the dua, the adhkar that he's reading. That's a very valid statement, because that's exactly what the Prophet ﷺ said. There was a man at the time of the Prophet ﷺ in the masjid praying by himself, and he was doing that. Okay, playing around with his beard. The Prophet ﷺ made a beautiful statement. And he was teaching his companions. And we'll come to the style of the Prophet ﷺ when he teaches. The Prophet ﷺ said, as the companions were watching this man, he said, لو خشع قلب هذا لخشعت جوارحه. Had the heart of this man okay, been in a state of khushu', it would have reflected on his limbs, on his actions, external actions. So whatever state the heart is in, you'll find your body in. For someone who falls into anything that is haram, and they say, well, you know, uh, iman is in the heart, faith is in the heart. Yeah? They don't pray, they might drink, they might do different sorts of bad things, okay? You can name them. And he says, you come and advise him, and he says, you know, Iman is in the heart. We know that this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Doesn't make sense. What's in the heart has to be refl reflected on the actions. So if your actions are evil, be sure that there's something wrong with your heart, seriously wrong with your heart. If your heart is in good shape, definitely it's going to reflect on your actions, period. As simple as that, okay? Now, our challenge, our challenge is to de find out the sweetness in salah, okay? Let me ask a question and see how many hands we, get, we, we have. Who feels sweetness as they perform the prayer every day? Who you know, who finds this kind of khushu' and this state of mind, this peace and sweetness? Who experiences, experience, who, who has the opportunity to experience this every day? No one? Okay. Who experiences this feeling, let's say once a week, at least? Once a week. Put your hands up. By, by the way, there's no showing off here. Because the Prophet ﷺ used to ask similar questions just for the sake of learning and teaching, okay? So who, roughly saying, experiences the sweetness of the prayer, the beauty of the prayer, this kind of focus in the prayer, at least once a week? I'm one of them, <laughs> okay? Okay, good, good, which is good. Who experiences this feeling once a year? No one. No one, <laughs> no one. Okay, just put Ramadan, Okay, out of this equation, because Ramadan is, is something special, outside Ramadan. Just your normal daily prayers, your normal daily prayers. Okay, who experiences this feeling once a month? No one. Did you notice something? We have two extremes here. You either don't experience that at all, or you either experience that in our case study, in our sample here, uh, once a week, at least. There's a very interesting phenomenon here. Very interesting phenomenon. And I will use it later. I'll use it later. So I'm, I'm building blocks now, and inshallah all of them will be put together at one, at one point in time. Going back to the Prophet's style of teaching. The style of teaching that we use with our kids and our probably our friends and even ourselves sometimes, is go and learn some principles and start t teaching people how they should behave. We always tell the kids, okay, you know, the pr in the presence of elderly people, don't talk, remain silent. Uh, when we go to the shop, yeah, don't give me trouble. 
and so on and so forth. When you go to school, do this. When you come to the masjid, do that. And most of the time, the kids don't abide by this. Because we're not using the Prophet's style in teaching. The Prophet ﷺ, if you noticed, he came to Mecca. Let me put it another way. Something happened in Medina one day. In the house of Abdul Rahman ibn Awf. We know the famous companion, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf. No, I'll take a story which is actually even m more telling. It, it helps me more. This is a house of one, one of the Ansar. One of the Ansar. There was, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf was there. Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, the Prophet's uncle. Hamza was there. Some other companions were there. Ali ibn Abi Talib wanted to marry Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ. But he was sitting at home and he was feeling frustrated about something. Now, he had uh, a servant girl or a maid. She approached him. She was an elderly woman. And she said, you know, somebody asked for the hand of Fatima. Are you going to stay at home forever? <laughs> when are you going to take action? <laughs> she said, people are asking for the hand of Fatima. Guess who asked for the hand of Fatima? Do you know who? Umar asked for the hand of Fatima, yes. But there was someone, someone was before, went there before Umar. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, radiallahu anhu, asked for Fatima's hand in marriage. But the Prophet ﷺ did not accept his proposal. Umar approached the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ did not accept his approval, uh, proposal. Then, this woman rushed to Ali and she said, go ahead, do something. <laughs> you know, as they say in some countries, pull your socks up. <laughs> go ahead. He said, How, you know, what can I do? I don't have anything to offer her as a dowry, as a mahar. I don't have anything. She said, you just go on the Prophet Sallallahu we'll, we'll find out a way. So he goes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he sits there. And Zayd ibn Haritha was with the Prophet Sallallahu Ali ibn Abi Talib sits there very shy, embarrassed. He's, he doesn't know how to initiate a proposal. He sits there because he doesn't have anything. He's sitting there, troubled, a bit nervous. The Prophet ﷺ looks at him and he says, Hey Ali, why did you come here? Uh, Ali said, well, nothing. The Prophet ﷺ said, maybe you came here to ask for the hand of Fatima. <laughs> In a very fatherly fashion. Obviously, I just want you to visualize, see that as a movie. Ali ibn Abi Talib is sitting there, he doesn't know how to initiate the proposal. The Prophet ﷺ asks him, why did you come here? He says, nothing. He said, maybe you came to ask for the hand of Fatima. Imagine what was the response of Ali ibn Abi Talib. <laughs> Baffled. <laughs> he was baffled. The Prophet ﷺ said, why are you hesitant? He said, I have nothing to offer her. The Prophet told, ﷺ told him, what happened, you know, what happened to uh, a dirah, an armor that I gave you in the, in the time of Badr? The Prophet, uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib said, it's, it's worth nothing. But the Prophet ﷺ then married him. But Ali ibn Abi Talib before that had two camels. Two camels. Camels are very expensive, even at that time. If you had a camel, you were considered to be relatively rich. Ali ibn Abi Talib had two camels, he lost them in one day. This has to do with Hamza and Abdul Rahman ibn Awf عنهم, and they were, as they were sitting in that home. Ali ibn Abi Talib wanted to get himself ready for Fatima before he approaches the Prophet So he had the two camels. One that he got, uh, that was his share from the spoils of, of Badr, spoils of war from Badr, and another camel given to him by the Prophet So he was there. And he was trying to get more money, more cash, in order to uh, marry Fatima. So he left them in the market, in a parking lot. And he went to do some business with a man. When he came back, he found his camel, or both his camels, cut into pieces. 
they've, you know, they had been slaughtered, they've been cut into pieces, their guts have been, you know, put in, in the street. Ali ibn Talib, look at that, he couldn't believe it. Now his dreams are vanishing. Camels are gone, there's no marriage. Ali ibn Abi Talib was about 23 at the time. Guess what did he do? Ali ibn Abi Talib, the strong warrior, this great man, do you know what he did? He was in tears. He cried. So he goes to the Prophet ﷺ and he rushes into the house of the Messenger ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ looks at Ali ibn Abi Talib in tears. He says, what's wrong? What happened? He said, Hamza. Hamza slaughtered my camels. Hamza slaughtered your camels? I mean, it doesn't make sense. Hamza is your uncle and my uncle. Why should he just slaughter your camels? And he didn't do anything with it. He didn't eat, even like eat them or prepare them for food. He just cut them into pieces and throw them. The Prophet wants to find out what's the story. So he goes to the house of that Ansari. He goes to the house, knocks the door. He gets permission to go walk in. And he looks at Hamza and he says, why did you do that? Hamza looks at the Prophet and he was reclining back. He looks at the Prophet head to toe. And he looks at Ali like that and he says, you're only servants, you're only slaves of, for, that belong to my father. That's Hamza. Do you know why? He was drunk. Hamza radiyallahu anhu was drunk. He was intoxicated. Could you believe that? Hamza was intoxicated. And the other companions were drinking. <laughs> By the way, they were together drinking. But we know that alcohol, khamr is haram. Do you believe that Hamza was drunk? Do you believe so? You think that's a true story? Why? Any explanation? That was before. Before khamr was made haram. That was before khamr was made haram. What's my, my point behind this story? The Prophet ﷺ, most of the time, he did not give his companions direct instructions. Look at the Prophet ﷺ, most of his teachings were not direct instructions. The Prophet ﷺ would give the general frame for people, believe in Allah, explain to them the meaning of life, okay? Put them in the right mindset, and then everything would go in the right direction. Everything would go in the right direction. And that's the reason why most of our teachings don't are not effective. Because we try to tell people what to do, but we, we, put, we never put them in the right mindset. The Prophet ﷺ would always make use of whatever situation he was in to teach people. That's, how, that's the best way you teach people. I know someone who managed to get his, his children from a young age to prefer death to drugs. They would die and they would never touch or come close to drugs or people who, you know, who uh, use drugs. Do you know how? They, he took them from an early age to a place, it was a uh, car park, multi-story car park. He took them there and this place was, you know, full with drug addicts, homeless people taking drugs. And it was saturated obviously with the smell of urine and all this filth. He took him from that early age to that place. When they saw people in that state and they saw younger girls, drug addicts offering themselves to people passing by. When they saw that, they associated a lot of disgust and hatred to, alcohol, uh, to, to drugs. So he says, late after that, his kids were exposed to drugs so many times. And Drugs were always out of the question to them. That's exactly how we should teach our children. Give them a real life experience rather than just keep telling them how things should be. And that's exactly how the Prophet ﷺ taught the companions. So going back to the man who was playing with his beards, with his beard. The Prophet ﷺ, okay, I, as far as I know, there's no hadith that says if someone plays with his beard, then that shows his heart is not concentrating in the prayer. But the Prophet ﷺ, you know, uh, used that incident 
in order to teach the companions. Had this man been in a state of khushu' and focus, he, you would never find him playing with his beard. Okay, so that's the way we should learn Okay, our salah and our khushu' and so on. And this is the way we should use with our kids, how to teach them, our friends. Whenever you see something, okay, teach them. Use that opportunity, seize the opportunity and teach them something real. It's, it's, it, you know, it sinks in a hundred times better than bringing a hundred books and tell, tell your kids, okay, learn this, learn that. Because it's a real experience. It incorporates more senses. It, it, it incorporates the feelings. People can connect on an emotional level to that experience and they could learn it. And it could be an experience for a lifetime. Okay? Now, I think this helps us realize that if we want to find the sweetness in the prayer, okay, our focus should not be primarily on the physical reality of the prayer, which is important. The Prophet ﷺ said, Sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli. Pray as you have seen me pray. Why is this? Because that's how we should pray. Why is this? Because if we pray in the manner in which the Prophet ﷺ prayed, you will find a huge difference in your salah. And this is the factor number one in having sweetness in salah. Keep that in mind. That's number one. Okay, now we got into the main topic or the main subject of this of this talk you want to ha find the sweetness of salah learn how the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam prayed and exactly pray just like that that's the number one now where do we get this from we get this from the fact that allah is the all wise allah is al-hakim what does wise mean in arabic al-hakim means the one who doesn't do things for no reason. The one who doesn't legislate things for no reason. Everything in Islam is carefully chosen by Allah. Everything. The smallest thing in Islam that you might think is trivial, unimportant, insignificant, has a reason or there's a reason that Allah made it that way. And it has an impact that you should expect from it. So many times people say, you know what a difference does it make to put your hands here or here, whether to, uh, you know, say Allahu Akbar, put your, Rafa al-Yadayn, put your hands up, or whether you put your hands on your knees as you make uh, ruku', okay, left, right, center, whatever you want to put, whatever you want. What difference does it make? I'm just making salah. Well, yes, ultimately you're making salah, but everything the Prophet ﷺ did in the prayer has significance. Allah says in Surah Al-A'raf, أَلَا لَهُ الْخَلْقُ وَالْأَمْرُ to Allah belong the creation and to Allah belong the legislation. Two things, creation, legislation. Allah created us in a certain format, physically, emotionally, mentally, psychologically, even socially. And he sent down a way of life, a system that is completely compatible with our creation. Completely compatible with our creation. Just like a lock and its key. Exactly. You cannot open that lock except with this key. Even if you get a key that is similar, but it's slightly different. Slightly different. And even you might sometimes be unable to tell the difference between both keys. One of them would open the lock and one would not. That's exactly how Islam works with our human nature. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he describes the Prophet he said لَوْ يُطِيعُكُمْ فِي كَثِيرٍ مِّنَ الْأَمْرِ لَعَنِتُّمْ If the Prophet were to obey you, if he were to follow your desires and your preferences, you would put yourselves in extreme hardship. SubhanAllah, even in your seeking ease, you will ultimately put yourself in hardship. Well, the uh, financial crisis in the world, the economic crisis in the world is, is, is a clear example. People wanted ease. People wanted, uh, you know, lack of control in terms of in their financial system. This is why riba is halal for them. Interest. A lot of the manipulation that is taking place in the financial world and economic world. Okay, people are seeking ease. They want more money. They want more affluence. They want more control over the world. But ultimately, what did they do? They made it even hard for themselves. 
Okay? So that's exactly what this verse is saying. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Islam in all its details compatible to your nature. Exactly. There's perfect match. If you miss out on any point, it's going to make a difference. It is going to make a difference. So even the place or where you place your hands in salah, okay, it makes a difference. Yes, your prayer is still valid, but it does make a difference. There's a reason Allah does not legislate anything, even if it's tiny, minute things, except for a reason. There's something, Allah doesn't do things randomly, okay? So the way the Prophet ﷺ prayed is one excellent way to help you reach your khushu'ah. But that could take you probably halfway through. What could bring about this weakness of the prayer? If you understand the concept of khushu'ah. Let me take some definitions. How do you define khushu'ah? You might say humility, I understand. I need you to explain more. No general words. Who knows, how do you define khushu'ah to yourself? That's a word we always use. How do you define khushu'ah? Concentration is not exactly khushu'ah. It leads to khushu'ah. Sin just one second. Sincerity is not khushu' in itself. It's strongly related, but it's not khushu'. Humbleness. Humbleness. Yes, humbleness is part of khushu'. It's a great part of khushu'. Humbleness. But can you dig anyone can dig a bit deeper? When you are at ease, it's, it's around the same, it's around this, the same level. I need something deeper. Excellent. Did you hear that? When the heart is connected to Allah. That's the essence of khushu'. That's the secret of salah. Honestly, that's the secret of salah. When the heart is connected to Allah in the prayer, that's khushu'. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Ra'd Allah says الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَتَطْمَئِنُّ قُلُوبُهُمْ بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَطْمَئِنُّ الْقُلُوبِ Those who have believed and their hearts find comfort, tranquility in the mention of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the remembrance of Allah. Indeed, indeed, with the remembrance of Allah, with I would paraphrase it now, with awareness of Allah, with connection with Allah, the hearts are at ease and are in a state of tranquility. Okay, so that's excellent, very good point. That's where khushu'a comes from, connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, you remember the question that I asked who finds khushu'a, who experiences khushu'a in salah? Let me ask you. Who, a general question, it's not related to Salah. Who experiences khushu' on a daily basis? Apart from Salah. That might be a surprise to you. But who experiences khushu' on a daily basis? Experience it on a daily basis. No, I'm, I'm saying khushu' Incorporating the meanings you all mentioned. Not Salah, you said. Huh? You said not Salah. Yes, outside. The prayer. Okay. Do you know who experiences khushu' most these days? Lovers. Lovers experience khushu'. What did the brother say khushu' is? Essence of khushu'. Connection to Allah. What do lovers have? Connection to their beloved ones. What happens? They develop this focus, yeah? This focus about their love, about the person they love. And have you, have you ever dealt with someone, with, let me say, a young man who loves a woman? <coughs> Let's go a bit deeper into human nature because it helps us understand what khushu is. You know, many times <clears throat> there's a problem with the way we, we understand or we relate to our deen, by the way. You can find someone who's practicing. Praise the, five, uh, praise the five daily prayers in the masjid, 
reads a lot of Quran, could be half of as well. Yeah? Excellent. Like a perfect Muslim. Go and see him in the market, cheats, lies, and does all sorts of bad things. It's schizophrenic. Two personalities. And you think that's uncommon? Very common, all around the Muslim world. All around the Muslim world. That's one of our biggest problems. Okay, back to the lover. Have you... Let me ask the question. Who has ever experienced someone, don't tell me about yourself, but about someone. Have you ever seen a lover, someone who's truly in love? Who, who hasn't seen <laughs> someone in love? Could you ever have a proper conversation with that person? Impossible. Impossible. Because whatever you talk about, they're going to always gravitate to, their to the person they love. Everything. Yeah? They might love like a girl, and you talk to them about cars. You talk to them about football. Okay? You start talking about football, about this team, that team, Manchester United, Liverpool, uh, Arsenal, etc. Okay? And then, all of a sudden, this person can